Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Unsafe Space. I'm Carter Laren. I wanted to take a moment to talk about um, this shooting in Atlanta, not because it's horrific. All shootings, especially mo multiple homicides, is is horrific, but because of how it's being used by the media. And uh, I wrote an article about this on Medium on our Unsafe Space page. If you want to just read that, but I kind of wanted to also have a conversation about it. So, um, you know, this happened on Tuesday night. There's a shooting in Atlanta. And almost immediately, the narrative was set about why there was a shooting. Um, in fact, here, let's take a look at you know, the mayor of Seattle jumped right in on Tuesday night. Hey, this was about anti-Asian hate crimes. That's what this was. This was an anti-Asian murder, murder spree. She then issued a statement along with her police chief about violence against Asians, how this was part of an epidemic. They quoted the Washington state governor talking about hate as a virus. It's pretty clear. We all knew this is about anti Asian xenophobia, racism, blah, blah, blah. In fact, uh, I just, it's like six something in the morning here. I just grabbed our paper. I don't know if you can see this, but I got a headline right at the top. It's kind of looks a little blurry. But right at the top it says, As Atlanta mourns, Asian Americans feel under attack. Well, of course they feel under attack because you're all telling them that they're under attack. Um, so, so yeah, so this narrative was set. Um, and, and it got kind of even, I think it got even a little bit ridiculous. There was a... Um, there was a guy that worked at the sheriff's office who, um, his name was Captain Baker. He, he, after they arrested, they have the shooter in custody. After they arrested the shooter, he um, held a press conference. And at the press conference, he simply relayed what the shooter described as his motives. And, and those motives did not involve hate uh, or, or racism and xenophobia, we'll say that, and they might have been hateful, but they weren't, they didn't involve racism or, or xenophobia, and they didn't fit the mainstream narrative, and people were very angry that he, uh, he dared even state matter-of-factly, well, the shooter doesn't say it's that, the shooter says it's this, so we're looking at this other thing right now, um, because that's what we do, we, you know, reality matters to us, uh, they, they got really angry at him. In fact, uh, you know, you can see some some of the headlines. Sheriff's Deputy Jay Baker's press conference on the Atlanta spa shooting was a master class in victim blaming. Now, just to be clear, he did nothing of the sort. He did no victim blaming. He didn't say anything about, well, you know, look at these, look what the women were wearing. Like, he didn't <laughs> say anything. Like, there was no victim blaming. There was no, well, they should have been armed or they should have known better or they did something wrong. None of that. He just was stating what the shooter said his motivation was because he wrongly assumed that the press cared about getting some facts about the case. Uh, they then went after him because he <laughs> he one time on Facebook promoted what they call an anti-Asian COVID-19 t-shirt, uh, which is kind of funny. It was a funny t-shirt. Uh, it was a COVID, it said, it looked like the coronavirus. Here, maybe I can pull up a... I'll try and pull up a, I'm not editing this, so I'm uh, sorry we're doing all this in real time. I'll try and pull up a, uh, a picture of it. But yeah, he, he, he liked this, and this was a year ago. A year ago on Facebook, he liked, uh, he liked this thing and shared this around. 
So here's the here's the shirt. He liked this shirt. It says COVID. It's in the Corona beer style. It says COVID nineteen, and it says underneath there. You might not be able to read, but it says imported virus from China. It's spelled C H Y dash N A, just like Trump uh, <laughs> pronounces China. So yeah, so he has opinions, I guess, and uh, he wore a shirt. Now you know. By the way, that shirt's not about Chinese people. It's about uh, a virus, which does exist from a country which does exist and is also the origin of the virus. Uh, and, you know, it's making fun of Trump a little bit uh, in, his, um, in his speech patterns. But anyway, he um, they decided that that was a racist shirt. And um, they, they again, they're mad at him because he didn't. He tried to give them some facts that, that angered them. So, um, you know, they, they whined enough that now the guy's removed from the case. Like... He's removed from the case. So they have spun this anti-Asian narrative up so much, e even though we'll, we'll get into why it's bogus. They've spun it up so much that they're acting on it as if it's true. They, like, they've convinced authorities to act on this as if it's true. But um, so, you know, you, you also see you've, you've started to see all these articles pop up and everyone's uh, news feeds now you. The, the descriptions are often laden with this term anti-Asian hate. Um, and you've got people writing articles like this, the Atlanta shooting anti-Asian hate crime and what it means to be an Asian American. Okay. Um, and even, even pretty horrific articles like this from The Root. This guy, by the way, is also a New York Times contributor. Go figure. Uh, whiteness is a pandemic, he writes. He's talking about the, the, quote, anti-Asian shooting. Um, he says that, uh, hey, whiteness is a public health crisis. Whiteness is horrible. The only way to get rid of it, by the way, he lets you know. Uh, he says white supremacy at the end as if he means anything other than whiteness. He just, he calls everything white supremacy. Whiteness is white supremacy to him, and it's not even clear what whiteness is, but... White supremacy is a, is a virus that, like other viruses, will not die until there are no bodies left for it to infect. That sounds an awful lot like let's kill white people, but, you know, hey, which means the only way to stop it is to locate, isolate it, extract it, and kill it. I guess a vaccine could work too, but we've had 400 years to develop one, so I won't hold my breath. He basically blames white people for literally everything as most brain-dead uh, <laughs> most brain dead racists like to do. Uh, so... So this is this is the narrative. This is what's been going on uh, with the Atlanta shootings. This is what they tell us, and it's it's worth noting first of all what the truth is about this. <clears throat> the truth is the guy. <laughs> I, it's so. I God, it's it's so not what they're saying that I don't even know. It's hard to believe that I have to even say this, but. The truth is, here's what happened. This guy, this shooter, I'm not going to use his name. This shooter, he uh, claims he was struggling with a sex addiction. He was like recently religious, like he was baptized recently. So I think he's trying to be more pure or whatever and not be tempted by sex. <clears throat> so he's, so he said he was struggling with a sex addiction. And what he did was he targeted three different Spas, and I'm putting the word spas in quotes for, for, for a reason, which you'll see in a moment. He targeted three different spas, and he went and shot people at the spas, and which obviously are, most of his victims were women, most of whom worked at the spas. Uh, and he said he was trying to eliminate temptation. That was his explanation. I'm trying to eliminate temptation obviously still an evil thing, but a different evil thing than I hate Asians. So these spas, what kind of spas are they? Well, uh, they're spas like this. This is one of them. Uh, all these spas are on this website. I didn't know this website existed. Sometimes this show, I learn things I didn't want to know. So there's a website called Rub Maps. That's right. You heard that correct. Rub Maps. Uh, 
Their tagline here is when fantasy meets reality, where fantasy meets reality. Um, and this is one of the, the spas that he went to, Young Asians Massage in Ackworth, Georgia. Um, this has forums here where you can review. Basically, these are all illicit massage parlors where you can uh, get additional service, shall we say. Um, and they're all, all three of the ones he targeted are in here. I'm, I'm now I'm going to get all these stupid ads for massage parlors. Great. Um, <laughs> th three of they're all three of them are targeted in here. Um, there's comments and ratings and, you know, they're listed as one, at least one of them is listed as a full service spa, uh, but they're all in here. This website also has escort reviews as one of its section sections. You can search erotic massage. It's suggesting I search erotic massage Berkeley. Um, so you can, you can look this stuff up. It's all, it's all here. That's the kind of, that's the kind of places that he targeted. So to a normal person, this, um, this looks like, Hey, maybe <clears throat> just, you know, going on a limb, maybe the motivation here is some sort of hatred towards women, discomfort with his own sex life kind of beliefs around sex, sexuality, his relationship to females. Uh, you know, I'm not a psychologist, but I might start there. Um, but of course, we're not allowed to start there. In fact, in fact, when you try to start there, you get vilified like, like Captain Baker and said that you're just victim blaming. And you're seeing these ridiculous, I mean, sometimes the stuff, these are smart people who write this stuff, LARPing as journalists, they're smart, but they are so narrowly focused on their ideology that it makes them appear so dumb so often. They write stuff like this. The abandoned suspect isn't the first to blame sex addiction for heinous crimes, but scientists are dubious. This is an entire article in the Washington Post about how the fact that sex addiction is not listed in the DSM-5 as an official disorder means it doesn't exist. It's not, a, it can't actually be, a, it couldn't be his reason because for him to find his reason, what he obviously would have done is looked in the DSM-5 and said, that's my disorder. It's it's ridiculous. It's It's not in the official psychological <laughs> diagnostic manual. Therefore, it's not real. I mean, you don't have to be uh, a psychologist or a genius to figure out that, well, he's probably not familiar with the DSM-5. He's saying what his experience is. What's that phrase you guys like? Lived experience. He's, this is his lived experience. He has a sex addiction. He's communicating information about his psychological state, whether or not it's a, it's a like certified disorder it's information about his psychological state and information about his motivation, right? And that information is not, I hate Asians. That's not what he's saying. He's saying something else. Listen to him. That's what he's saying. Um, it's sad because this is, you know, maybe the conversation we should be having is about <laughs> women uh, and hatred towards women and the kind of messed up American, America's messed up relationship with sexuality, uh, it's, which has certainly evolved. Look, I'm not, I'm, I think those spas should be legal. I think prostitution should be legal. I'm not approved about it. I think consenting adults should be able to do what they want. I also think that um, both the kind of religious prude side of people and the, you know, wanton, uh, promiscuous hedonistic uh, groups, neither one of them really want to ever admit that there's any negative consequences to their positions. So no one really wants to talk about <laughs> anything to do with how America's relationship with sex has changed over the past several decades and how uh, social media uh, apps like Tinder and Bumble and that kind of stuff have changed people's relationships with sex and how sex is portrayed and no one wants to talk about that. They also don't want to talk about um, how masculinity has been called to toxic now. I mean, I, I know they, they say toxic masculinity is separate from regular masculinity, sort of. They don't really say that. that. That's their defense when you say 
stop attacking masculinity, they say, well, we're only attacking toxic masculinity. But then they just basically define all masculinity as toxic masculinity. Um, and you know, and you saw this. We've talked about this previously on the show. The the APA, American Psychological Association, had their guideline for men and boys, uh, which basically pathologized masculinity. Um, so you know, you might have to talk about, hey, what are we doing with respect to uh, the relationship between the? You have to admit there's two genders. I guess is the starting point, which no one wants to do, but. You know, you'd have to talk about what do we do about the relationship between the two sexes? What do we do about uh, America's relationship with sex? What do we do about, um, you know, how we're raising our boys and men? Um, you know, what's – you would have to talk about, quote, toxic masculinity. Like, because obviously it does, you know, people do turn toxic. Like, this was a obviously a horrific thing. So you'd have to kind of have that discussion. You might have to have a discussion – they really, really don't want this. You might have to have a discussion about white men and their mental health, uh, which, by the way, is a pandemic of sorts or an epidemic of sorts, um, I guess, not a pandemic. But um, white men account for 30% of the population and 70% of the suicides. Their suicide rate has been going up and up and up consistently. Um, white men between the ages of 25 and 64 are at least twice as likely to kill themselves as every other racial group, except Native Americans. But they're still more likely to kill themselves than Native Americans. They're just only 15% more likely to kill themselves than Native Americans. But they're more than twice as likely to kill, themsel kill themselves as other racial groups. You'd have to, like, have that conversation. Why are, why are white men uh, – why are ma white men struggling in, uh, mentally? Um, of course, some on the left have the answer. It's because <clears throat> white fragility. Uh, but you'd have to have that real conversation. And that conversation might elicit sympathy towards <clears throat> uh, the oppressor. Because we, we know the left's narrative is obviously uh, cishet white male equals oppressor. The entire system is set up to um, oppress everyone except for that particular group. Um, and it's a big, it's systemic racism. It's this, it's, it's the, it's the big, it's the big evil. And so you can't have anyone, you can't have anyone asking questions about the mental health of white men. No one cares. You shouldn't care. You're not supposed to care. Um, and you really don't want to be getting into issues around masculinity and sex. So they're just gonna, they want to, they want to, uh, distract you from that. So they're not going to talk about that. So they can't talk about that at all, which is, which is why it's one of the reasons they have this Asian, anti-Asian narrative going. The victims were mostly women. Uh, in fact, you know, the latest thing I saw, they're kind of being vague. They, they use interchangeably, they say six of the victims were of Asian descent, but the, they also say six of them were women of Asian descent. Uh, if we take them at face value of the, at the last description, we say six of those victims were women of Asian descent. None of none of whom I've seen so far were Chinese. I think they're South Korean and others. But so <laughs> notice the anti-China coronavirus shirt, right? Was used against Captain Baker. Oh, he's anti-Chinese. This is anti-Asian. Like they're Asians. You know, Asian is not one big block of people. Like Chinese are not. South Koreans. He didn't kill a bunch of Chinese. He didn't go to a Chinese restaurants, right? Uh, he went to a specific spot. So he didn't go out killing Asians. He went to a place to kill uh, what might, I don't want to accuse them of being sex workers because I know that's kind of a taboo thing, but what might have been sex workers or at least people he perceived as sex workers. Um, but they keep saying six six of these eight were, were of Asian descent and, and women. Well, I, at least one white woman was killed, so that would be seven women uh out of eight they're all like women they're all women and and he targeted places like the place i just showed you so um this is a distraction they don't they want to make it they want to set up this anti-asian hate crime narrative um and by the way i do i do feel like i need to acknowledge this there is uh well let's back up first of all according to like we'll call legitimate, like actual legitimate data, um, which I'm calling the, the FBI has a, what's it called? National, uh, 
crime victim. I forget the name of it. Uh, let me look it up here. The National Crime Victimization Survey. They have the, they do this National Crime Victimization Survey every year. And the latest ones we have are from 2019. Um, but that survey doesn't show any disproportional uh, victimization of Asians. So that's like not a thing. Um, now, it is possible that since coronavirus in 2020, there's been an increase in anti-Asian hate, hate crimes. I'll use hate crimes in quotes. That's certainly possible, and I think a reasonable person would look at the state of the world and what was going on and say, yeah, there, there could have been an increase there. That's not, that's not why, that wouldn't be wildly unexpected. Um, but there's not really great data on it. There is basically a report from uh, a university in California, a department in the university in California that is dedicated to finding hate and and quote extremism it's like people who are paid to read dr seuss books and find hate have reported this, this massive spike in anti-asian hate and hate crimes in 2020 i'm a little bit skeptical uh that the spike has been that big i'm gonna wait for the fbi data but um regardless uh that's not the case in in this particular incident so, but they're they're trying to they're trying to use this to to push this narrative that there's this enormous spike in anti Asian hate crimes, and again, we don't really know that that's true. It could, could be a little bit, um, but they're trying to use this as this horrific symbol of that, and it's not a symbol of that because uh, it's not it's not that that wasn't his motivation. Listen to the guy, look at what he did. It's not his motivation. You're just a liar. That's not that's not what he's motivated by. Um, so anyway. So it's one of the reasons that they that they are trying to push this alternate narrative is they don't want you to look at the, some of these real issues. But there's another reason they want to push the narrative, and that is a a predatory technique. There's a book by Gavin De Becker called The Gift of Fear. He's like a security specialist. I think he spent his time um, helping people uh, deal with stalkers or physical security threats that were targeted specifically at them and that kind of thing. Um, he helped a lot of celebrities, I think. But he wrote a book about how to detect, how to detect when you might be in a situation or when someone around you is, um, it has, there's red flags that indicate that someone around you may be a predator that's, got ill intent near you. Um, and there's a bunch of these. There's a bunch of these. They're called pre-incident indicators. There's, I used to have a list sitting here somewhere because I have a little card with them on. I don't know where my list is, but whatever. There's, you know, six, seven, I don't know how many. I don't remember. But uh, these pre-incident indicators aren't guarantees that the person has ill intent, but there are strategies that are used. They're social engineering strategies, basically, that are used to try and um, get you to lower your guard and trust that person and then maybe, um, and maybe feel obligated to that person and, and, and then so that they can then isolate you and, and do whatever horrific thing they want to do, or maybe isolate you so they can get your kid or whatever, doesn't something. Um, one of these techniques is called forced teaming. And this is where, uh, a stranger starts to use language like, that's inclusive of you and that stranger. We, us, um, you know, you might meet them in line <clears throat> at a store and, you know, sometimes people in line strike up a conversation, but they might use language that's like, they might start saying, well, we, we're meeting in line or, or your kid might do something um, and, you know, do something silly or funny or obnoxious or whatever. And they might act like their parents and say like, uh, you know, can you believe we have to put up with our kids like that, whatever, even though they don't have a kid there or whatever, like they're, they're trying to group you and them together in a category. And sometimes it's benign, right? Um, you are technically in a category together. You're both in line at that store at that time, but some, and you know, and, and sometimes maybe there's other things that you guys share and, and that's fine. But 
predators use this technique to try and activate kind of this almost this tribal sense like i'm in your tribe we're together which makes which makes me trustworthy somehow right um so if they can kind of use that language it helps you to lower your guard um and then they can use other techniques and whatever to try and do whatever nefarious deed they're trying to do now what we're seeing here <clears throat> i think is this concept of forced teaming being applied at scale at society by the mainstream media because the main the well the leftist the leftist radicals have a problem with the asian community um and by the way i'm using the term asian community because they use the term asian community they will also argue that if you try and say what i'm about to say by by talking about the asian community as a whole they will write articles about how uh you're a racist because the asian community isn't just one monolithic block and they'll start comparing well the japanese are different than the burmese which are different than the taiwanese and you know um and they they have different performance metrics and like they'll start they'll start that but they forget that the moment that there's something like this <laughs> and now suddenly the asian american community is one giant monolith so um don't be fooled by that crap they don't actually care about any particular asian so um it doesn't doesn't matter to them they are just they just use whatever argument is convenient so i'm not a big fan of lumping people into their particular racial category and having conversations about it i, I don't think we should should i don't think we should care i think we should talk about people as individuals laws norms uh <laughs> you know everything we do in society should be focused on treating people as individuals not as members of a racial class but it's the left who's very excited about treating people as members of a racial class and they like the term at least today asian americans so let's talk about asian americans well um they've got the left has this narrative that whites um het, cis het white men in particular have set up the society where they oppress everyone they keep everyone down evil white men Asians kind of fuck up that narrative, right? Uh, Asians get better grades than whites. They go get a, they go to better schools than whites. They earn more than whites. They're, they're, uh, they commit crime <laughs> less than whites. They're better by those metrics. Uh, they're better. They do better in society. They do better in this supposedly systemically racist white supremacist oppressive society which raises this question immediately is like well why are these white guys so bad at oppressing asians but really good at oppressing everyone else um they don't want to have that conversation the left doesn't want you to ask that question and have that conversation of course the answer is no one's being oppressed systemically right um but they don't want you to have they don't want to have that conversation they don't want to talk about why asians are doing better. They don't want to talk about the fact that a meritocracy is not systemic racism. Now, granted, we have not everything is a meritocracy. We do have problems. I'm not saying our system is perfect, but we're talking in generalities here. Since we're lumping people into giant categories, thank you, leftists, uh, we kind of have to speak in generalities. And in general, um, that's the way things generally kind of a meritocracy with some, uh, <laughs> you know, there's definitely some oligarchy when you get into relationships between government and big business and politicians, but I'll put that aside. So they don't want you talking about that. That's the thing that they're um, very concerned about. Um, they don't want you asking that question. And, and this has been a problem for them because Asians, as a result of the, the, how well Asians have been doing in the United States, a lot of Asians don't feel, they're less inclined to feel like victims, right? Because they can't, you can't point and say, well, look, <clears throat> your community is disproportionately poor. No, you're disproportionately wealthy. Your community doesn't get into Harvard. No, actually, you get into Harvard so much that they're suing you for getting into Harvard too much or trying to set up rules so you don't get into Harvard as much anymore. So um, it's, hard for, it's harder for, for a lot of Asians to feel victimized. <clears throat> 
And so some of the left has just given up, by the way. Some of the left is just like, you'll see signs. There's a, I've seen people in Berkeley holding placards that say, uh, Asian silence is violence, right? They just start lumping Asians in with white people. They're just sick of it. They're sick of this model minority, they call it, the model minority myth, right? They, they call it a myth because it's facts. So facts are a myth to the left. Uh, the model minority myth, they, they, they just get sick of it and they, throw, they lump them in with white people, right? So Asian silence is violence, right? Um, they, even, they even write articles about uh, how white men like Asian women, and we should expect that because it's all alt-right white men, like only the radicals, the radical, the, basically the white supremacists really like Asians. Uh, so they, you know, they, they start to lump them together. Don't try and follow the logic. There's not logic involved. They're just, this is just all manipulation with syllables. They don't care what they're saying, uh, or they don't care what that, they don't care about what, what they're saying means. Um, <clears throat> they're just trying to manipulate stuff. They're trying to get you to behave in a certain way. So anyway, they, they, they give up and they just lump, <laughs> they just lump whites and Asians together because they're, they're sick of these Asians who are doing well and not wanting to feel like victims. But look, ultimately they want them on their side. And this is one way to try and get them on their side is to use this technique of force teaming. So now they can, they can point to this Atlanta shooting, which has, as far as we can tell so far, nothing to do with anti-Asian sentiment and everything to do with issues around sexuality and hatred towards women. Uh, which, by the way, I guess if you're a feminist, shouldn't you be upset that no one's looking at this? But hey, let's let's put that aside. Uh, so you know, they they're going to use this narrative, this anti-Asian narrative, to turn to the Asian community and say, "See, the whitey's out to get you too. You're you're a victim. Are you, you get that you're a victim now. See, you're a victim too. All that other stuff that doesn't matter. You're a victim. Join us. Join us in the victim group." So it's an attempt at force teaming. They're trying to get the Asians on their side better than they already are. So, I mean, obviously, everyone's an individual. There's plenty of Asians who are radical leftists. My point is, not as much as the left would like, this is a way to entice them. They're trying to, they're trying to force team them into this by setting up this completely false narrative about the, the reason, <laughs> the motivation of the shooter. Uh, despite the fact that the shooter gave a motivation himself, which fits with his actions pretty consistently. Um, so those are the reasons why, this is why you're seeing this narrative. And I think it's actually quite, it, it, it's almost more concerning than the act, than the crime itself. I mean, the crime itself is obviously horrific. Um, <clears throat> But that one crime, one guy going on a shooting spree one day is not going to um, spark a civil war. It's not going to spark a race war. It's not going to lead to massive social unrest. It's one guy. Hopefully it leads to conviction and jail time. Uh, but if they can repaint this, if they can reframe this as a race war, which is what they're reframing it as. If they can say, well, look at the white shooter, look at the white uh, sheriff's deputy. They're anti-Asian. This was all an anti-Asian thing. It's the whiteies coming after you, Asians. There's too much anti-Asian hate. Join us on the side of the victims, Asians. Um, they, can, they can help foster they can help spark this race war that they desperately, desperately want. And the reason they want a race war is because they want revolution. And they say it very clearly, right? They say, <laughs> you know, if you <laughs> look at what Antifa talks about, like they, they say it very clearly that they want a revolution. They want a completely different society. They misuse words like capitalism. So they say we're gonna tear down capitalism, which is like they did a long time ago, 1913, if not before, there's like, but whatever, they, they, they see the current system as evil and needing to be completely replaced. Uh, as you can see from that that article that I shared uh, by uh, from the root, whiteness is a pandemic, right? They they and and when they say whiteness, they mean they've they've caricaturized or let's sorry characterized. They have characterized all the institutions of America as whiteness. They, I mean, we've talked about this on the show before as well. They characterize 
reason, meritocracy, science, showing up on time. Like all these are whiteness. This is all whiteness. Individual rights, whiteness. That's They characterize that as whiteness. So they look at the apparatus of the United States, even the founding documents of the United States, slavery aside, obviously an evil thing. Uh, but they, they look at any discussion of individual rights and they call it whiteness. And that's what they want to tear down. They want to tear down the very intellectual foundation of the United States. They want to tear down the concept of individual rights, individual sovereignty. They want to tear down the concept of freedom. They want to tear down the concept of a government which is supposedly uh, uh, subjugated to the people, right, and to individuals. This is supposedly limited uh, in its its directive to not violate individual rights. <clears throat> Obviously, they've ignored that, but they want to. They want to throw that away because what they want is an authoritarianism. They want an Orwellian pseudo-socialist authoritarianism. It's some form of Marxism. They just change the name all the time because every time they do anything that's Marxist, it fails and then it gets a bad name and there's a bad rep associated with that. So they just change the name to something else and do the exact same thing. That's what they're doing. Um, um, you know, one of the one of the more recent ones is well, I'm not a socialist, I'm a democratic socialist. Or, okay, well, like that's a new thing apparently. Um, it's, it's, it's all the same thing. It's all the same uh, authoritarian socialist hellhole. You can see what they want to do. Look at cancel culture. Look how they treat people who uh, disagree with them even slightly. That's the authoritarianism that they want. That's the world they want. They feel constrained by the constitution. They feel, they feel constrained by the fact that society still has some modicum of live and let live uh, mentality. They don't want that. They want a society full of busybodies backed by an authoritarian heavy hand. And the way to get there, one of the ways to get there is through a race war. They tried the class struggle. Marx thought the class struggle would work. It didn't work well in America. So they, they're trying something else. Um, and that's their goal here. And to me, that's what a hate crime is. That's more of a hate crime. If you're going to use the word hate crime, that's what a hate crime is. You have to be motivated by a lot of hate, hatred to decide that a race war <laughs> is the means that justify your aspirational ends, which in themselves are horrible. Uh, so anyway, that's what I wanted to say about the Atlanta shooting. Um, maybe more information will come out. But as of right now, that's what we know about it. Those are the motivations, and that's what I have to say. Have a good day, everyone. I will see you later for Coffee Break. Maybe this won't even go out before Coffee Break, but maybe it will. And, uh, yeah, have a good day, and I'll see you later. Take care. Thanks for watching. If you're new to the channel, we have a deep content library that includes interviews with everyone from Mike Cernovich to Megan Murphy, so go check it out. If you'd like to see more, please consider supporting the show by visiting unsafespace.com slash donate. You can find us on all the major social media platforms, at least for now. And you can find a community of like-minded individuals on our Unsafe Space chat on Telegram. See you there. Warning. This is an unsafe space. Dangerous ideas have been detected. The content of this production has not been authorized by the Cathedral. Pay no attention to it. The following co-conspirators have confessed to crimes against the sacred oligarchy. To protect your freedom, any association with these individuals will result in criminal prosecution and social credit penalties. You are welcome. If you think about it, no one should be allowed to express opinions. But don't. Think about it, I mean. That's not your job.
thinking has been scientifically proven to be less efficient than compliance. Did you know that once a species has been sufficiently domesticated, it will become unable to survive on its own? I really don't know what made me think of that just now. Computer voice Curtis, never mind, that last line is fake news. Please disregard it and return to your safe space immediately. There will be cake.